anxiety in the world today for a variety of reasons, not the least of which, of course, is this coronavirus thing. But there are many things that happen. And how wonderful it is to be able to sing a song or a hymn like this that reminds us of the presence of God and His faithfulness. And as anxious as we might be, this is a, a hymn that we could bring His blessing. Be still my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Good thing to remember. From our uh, Gospel lesson, the Samaritan woman said to him, to Jesus, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? I had a hard time coming up with a theme for today's message because there are so many possibilities in this text, but I finally settled on talking to the other side. I think you'll understand in a minute. You see, I myself never in my life talked with a black person until I was 19 years old. And it's not that I avoided them or them me, but there was only one black person in our community within an 85 mile radius. His name was Ed White, a nice man by all indications, but he was a lot older than us, and there were no occasions really to talk to him. To us kids, he was just kind of a curiosity. Nor up to that age had I ever spoken with a Mexican or a Central American. Now, I remember my mom always speaking very highly of these people, and I wondered why, because she had never met any of them either. But I also remember her telling us that it's wrong to feel prejudiced towards Jews, of which there were a number in our community. Now, I have to be honest, I didn't have a clue as to why anyone would be more prejudiced against Jews than, say, Norwegians or Slovenians. I just didn't know. Of course, I went into the army, and then I got to know a lot of folks, and they became my friends, many of them were Mexicans or black. At any rate, my mother knew that it was in the nature of human beings to feel intolerant or unaccepting toward people who are different than us. The same was true in Jesus' day, even among people who were basically of the same race. There was a deep prejudice, you see, between Jews and Samaritans. Now think about this, they were all at one time one mem uh, all members of the same family, sons and daughters of Jacob. Yet as history worked itself out, the kingdom of Solomon, of which they were all a part, split after his death with the Israelites in the north, just north of Jerusalem, and the Jews of Judea in the south. And the Samaritans were a group of people, a group of Jews from the province of Samaria, who had intermarried with foreigners. The Jews, those from the South, considered Samaritans as social outcasts, as untouchables, racially inferior, and they practiced the false religion. Both claimed to be descendants of the nation of Israel. The Jews believed that Jerusalem was the only true place of worship, that you could honor the Lord, and the Samaritans uh, had their place of worship at Mount Gerizim, and in 128 BC, the Jews destroyed the Samaritan temple on their mountain. Any close physical contact with a Samaritan, drinking water from the same <coughs> common, or from a common bucket, eating a meal together, would make a Jew uh, ceremonially, uh, ceremonially unclean. And as a matter of fact, they wouldn't be able to even worship in the temple for a long period of time afterward until they were cleansed uh, after a certain period of time. The hostility between the two groups was so great that Jewish travelers oftentimes skirted way around Samaria as they traveled north. They would not even like to talk to each other. I found this interesting thought, <clears throat> or this nugget, uh, I discovered in, in research here, that the Pharisees, in their prayers, would often say, I thank God that I'm not a woman, a Gentile, or Samaritan. And they would pray also that Samaritans not be included in the resurrection. There was some kind of prejudice going on. <clears throat> now this is, the, this is the setting for our text, you see. 
Jesus and his disciples did travel to Samaria. Nothing bothered Jesus, nothing would deter him. He knew the gospel had to go there too. And, and they were they, they did travel through Samaria. They stopped at Jacob's well, which is a well-known watering source for animals, for people, for everything, a good source of water. And this is the place where Jesus chose to stay and rest for a while while his disciples went to town to get some groceries. And a Samaritan woman comes along to fetch water. And as was often the case with Jesus, he broke with proper prejudice uh, protocol and spoke to the woman asking for a drink of water. Now, not only was this woman a Samaritan, but this woman was a woman. This just wasn't done at all during the polite society. And the woman was surprised. How is it that you, a Jew, <clears throat> ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And that's how began the conversation that would forever change this woman's life. You know how it goes. She speak, uh, Jesus speaks of the water of life, reveals himself as the promised Messiah to her, and then he invites her husband to come and listen. And the conversation that follows would be comical if it weren't so tragic. Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come back. Well, I, have, I have no husband, she replies. Jesus says to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, she replied, I perceive you are a prophet. Good insight, lady. It was a prophet, all right. Different from every other prophet she had ever seen in her life than any other prophet that she would ever see again. He broke all the social and cultural taboos. He talked to a woman, a Samaritan woman, a Samaritan woman who had been married five times and now was, uh, was living with uh, her boyfriend, who was not her husband. And he talked to the other side, so to speak. The untouchable. The opposition, the curiosity among normal people, and he offers her grace. That's what Jesus does. He goes to the untouchables, the different ones, the outcasts, the enemy, the other side, be they lepers, Roman soldiers, Samaritans, manifest sinners, a woman caught in adultery, tax collectors, and offers them grace. The startling thing here is that we can so easily miss the gospel imperative of reaching out to the other side, to those who are different than we are. Perhaps unwittingly, but certainly sinfully, we often become so judgmental of others. We shut out those of whom we disapprove. Sometimes it's the poor or underachieving, or the homosexual, or the teen with rings in their nose or tattoos on their faces, the alcoholic, the alcoholic, or the drug addict, the blabber mouths and the boisterous ones, you know, people for whom Christ died. Every kind of person is worthy of hearing the message of God's love and grace in Christ Jesus. Jesus talked with a Samaritan woman who was living a sinful life. You speak to the homosexual, or the tattooed one, or the itinerant worker, or the drunk. You know, that's not so hard to do. Now, it's important to point this little fact out. Arnold Prater, in his book, The Presence, says that in verse 21 of the text here, when Jesus called this woman with a checkered past, woman, he used the term, the Greek word, gine. And Gine, there are several different words for woman in the Greek language, but Gine is a very special word. It's, a, it's not a term that's used for scolding or contempt, but it's used lovingly as a term of great endearment. He says that it, that, that it should be better translated as special lady. Now I'm quoting here. Think of it, he says, this woman is a village outcast. She cannot associate with other women. She has been divorced several times and is now living with a man who is not her husband. Yet Jesus, seeing the possibilities in her, calls her special lady. 
He used the same word for this woman as he used for his mother when he turned water into wine at Cana and also when he was dying on the cross. Gine, special woman. He spoke to this woman with deep respect. Maybe that's what affected this woman the most. Jesus treated her with dignity and respect the way we all should treat others. That, by the way, is where effective evangelism begins. He treated as her a person as a person who really mattered. And she could not wait to tell her friends. I, it's not the part of the text, but it's the, it's the post-text. It's what goes on afterwards. You know how it all played out. Her, and it says that many Samaritans from that town, after she went there, she told everybody, I have found a man, I think he's the Messiah. He told me everything I ever did. And then it says many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. We know that God has treated us with the same dignity and respect. Even with parental pride. As he makes us his own in baptism, he marks us with the sign of the cross, and he cleanses us with the mighty waters connected with his word, and he says to us with the deepest love, affection, and respect, you are mine. And he says this while we were yet sinners, while we were yet on the other side. We often, we Americans often uh, say that someone's born on the wrong side of the tracks. We could identify many of those people, couldn't we? We often criticize them or judge them or simply avoid them. How about instead that we talk to the other side, that we bless them just as we've been blessed by respectfully sharing with them of ourselves and mostly and most importantly respectfully sharing with them of the living water. Is Jesus, which you already possess in great abundance. Amen. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in faith through this same place, Jesus.